Tonight on Perspective. You very quickly get a sense of what the local Congolese cuisine is like. People find dead animals in the forest. They take this animal and they use it for bushmeat. Yule, yule nyama. Ekumgonjo. Good evening and thank you for joining us on this premiere episode of season two of Perspective. My name is John Allen Namu. We're in a new home, KTN News, and on a new time slot, 8 p.m. Now this season, we promise to continue bringing you those stories from the world around you, take an in-depth look about stories close to your heart, and tell you about those stories that you should take a closer look at. We've got a fresh new look as well as one extra segment this season, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, let's take a look at that one story that got to the heart of the news on Headline versus Bottom Line. Last Sunday, KTN reporters Saida Swale and Ian Wafula did a story on the disappearance of a businessman, Nasir Abdul Malid, who was apprehended by a group of men and bundled into the back of a vehicle. When bystanders tried to intervene, the men drew pistols and threatened them. That's the headline. The bottom line is that there are far too many of these similar incidents happening across the country. Just who are these armed kidnappers that would be so brazen as to disappear young men in broad daylight? In a number of these cases, the armed groups of kidnappers identified themselves as members of the anti-terrorism police unit. All of these branches of the disciplined forces have strenuously denied these allegations, blaming criminality for these strange disappearances. But this wouldn't be the first time in Kenya's recent history that members of the disciplined forces have stood accused of forcefully disappearing individuals under various pretexts, from the Mungiki menace of yesteryears to the war on terror today. If members of the disciplined forces are not behind these disappearances, then answers must be given over who the groups of kidnappers are. Criminality, whether it comes in or out of uniform, must be fought with vigor. If Kenyans are to put their faith in the sworn duty of officers, many of whom uphold the law daily to protect them. On now to our main feature. Now, Africa is a continent with many blessings, but disease, unfortunately, is one of its perennial curses. The Ebola virus is one such disease, and last year it swept through the West African part of this continent in three countries, leaving 12,000 people dead. Liberia, which had just got over the Ebola pandemic there, has just reported a new case of Ebola. While we mourn with the thousands of families that are bereaved in West Africa, we here at Perspective are taking a different look at why Ebola may just be on this continent a while longer. And we're telling this story from the country that gave Ebola its name, the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a story about a link between bushmeat and Ebola. Take a look. <laughs> The Democratic Republic of Congo, the heart of Africa, colorful, beautiful, and sometimes bizarre. of the Congo with the return to Leopoldville of deposed Premier Lumumba following his capture by crack commandos of strongmen captured by... It's a country whose history is tragic, whose people have been devastated by war in the past, but this is also a country that the rest of the continent can look to in the fight against Ebola. Don't panic. After all, this is the country that has a river from which Ebola got its name. West of the Congo, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone are just getting over the worst of the pandemic, with over 12,000 people dead from the virus in the three countries. 
two months after the pandemic had been declared in West Africa, the DRC announced that they were experiencing an outbreak there too. A common denominator between the two separate outbreaks was their cause, bushmeat. I visited the DRC days after the country had been declared Ebola-free. In Kinshasa, the capital, it certainly doesn't look like a country that had just been through the horror that the world witnessed its neighbors to the West endure. In fact, it hardly ever comes up in conversation. But talk about bushmeat, and everyone points to the places that they go to get their fix. any one of Kinshasa's markets. We picked a market named after Congo's rebel turned leader, Laurent Desiree Kabila. Here you'll find what is likely the largest gathering of wild animals outside of the wild, all for sale at a price. Feeling like a little eel? They have them live, right next to the stand where you'll find live turtles, Looking to make some crocodile fillet for friends, and you'll get it with its hide still on. And of course, the animal blamed for Ebola outbreaks in fiction and reality, the monkey is here. Smoked, dried, with the option to carry it whole or get a kilo for a thousand Congolese francs, or slightly above 100 Kenyan shillings, three times less than what it would cost to buy a kilo of beef. The market is a place that will engage the eyes and assault the nostrils. But it's also a great place to put your ear on the ground as well. Tongues are wagging about the effects that Ebola has had on sales here. When you're in Marché de la Liberté, Laurent Désiré Kabila, or Liberty Market in English, you very quickly get a sense of what the local Congolese cuisine is like, from wild pig to antelope to exotic insects even. They've got it all. But when you want to judge public sentiment about Ebola, this is also the best place to look. At the end of the row of pork and antelope meat sellers, 55-year-old Yangisa Iwai gets ready to make his 10th sale of antelope for the day. He's one of the more experienced butchers here, having sold bushmeat here for 15 years. But the four months of the Ebola pandemic haven't been good to his weighing scale. Since the Ebola outbreak, people stopped buying bushmeat and we suspended sales in the market. When it was over, people still felt our meat was dangerous and few customers came back. Mama Jeanette Elofa had to diversify what she sells. She now trades in all kinds of meat. Today, she's selling boa constrictor. She used to sell mainly warthog and antelope meat, but since the outbreak, she's had to sell as much as she can to make do. People should come back and buy. There is no more Ebola. The sale of bushmeat in Equator province, the region where the outbreak began, was banned almost immediately, but customers used to their daily pound of flesh felt unsafe. Hit especially hard were vendors who sold monkey meat. <laughs> When I get to Mama Maggie Moseka's stall and ask her about the fear of Ebola, I don't need a translator to guess that she's very upset. Today, I haven't sold any monkey. My children might sleep hungry. Men now have no work. She contends that her mainstay product, monkey meat, has been hardest hit by Ebola, and she decides to show how confident she is in her product. Where is the Ebola? There is no Ebola here. People are just spoiling the reputation of our meat. What's the difference between crocodile and monkey? By this time, a small crowd was gathering, and she used this opportunity to make me a part of her tasting party. And not one to upset an old lady. I had my first taste of monkey meat. Tough, chewy, almost wooden meat that tasted like dry grass. But Maggie's point had been made. Her meat is free of Ebola. 
Stigma pointing to the role of bushmeat trade in the spread of Ebola isn't just rumor like Maggie would have me believe. Both here in the Congo and in Guinea where the West African outbreak began, the search for bushmeat has been blamed as well as the vectors in the animal kingdom that may spread it. It is very likely that Ebola is one of the Ebola vectors are bats. It is very likely that non-human primates, gorilla, chimpanzee, are infected via uh, bat droppings or fruits that are half eaten by the bats that the chimpanzee and gorilla eat. And Ebola kills these animals. People find dead animals in the forest, they take this animal and they use it for bushmeat or in the case of gorilla sometimes or cultural magical practices. And by butchering the animal that has been infected, because Ebola is transmitted by contact, they get infected by themselves. So that's the link. In the current case, the one we have now in Guinea, uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, the patient zero, the first infected patient, is a two-year-old kid. It's very unlikely that this two-year-old kid was out in the forest butchering bushmeat. The strain of Ebola in this outbreak is the same as the strain found in a previous outbreak in 1995 called the Zaire Ebola virus. Fruit bats within the Congo West African forest belt have been identified as hosts of the deadly virus and this is how the Ebola cycle typically works. The bats who mostly live in colonies near forests will leave droppings or half-eaten fruit that will be eaten by other more typical carriers like monkeys, pigs, and sometimes antelopes, thus spreading to a wider group of animals. Here's where human culture comes in. Hunters will often find a dead or dying animal and slaughter it for its meat. When touching the infected blood and secretions of these animals, Ebola gets transferred to humans. The virus begins to manifest in humans through fever, diarrhea, vomiting, and a range of other symptoms, and human-to-human -human contact does the rest. Physical contact with human secretions like blood, mucus, urine, vomit, feces, even tears will pass the virus on to another person. The infections in the Congo followed the exact same path so closely that the World Health Organization, when reporting about the outbreak in the Congo, called it, quote, a classic outbreak, end quote. Eating the meat, a lot of which is already dried of fluid or cooked at temperatures that would destroy the virus, is not the likely source of Ebola. It's in the bloody business of slaughter of bushmeat that supplies the 12 million residents of Kinshasa and the tens of millions of bushmeat lovers across the Congo that the danger continues to lurk. And as long as there's money to be made in getting your hands bloody, the bushmeat business will continue to be haunted by Ebola. Ebola kills 50% of those people who contract the virus. But after the break, we're going to take you to a region of the Democratic Republic of Congo that in the past had been affected by Ebola and speak to a man who is lucky to be alive, having survived the virus.